Now I have built a lot of custom DS consoles in my time and I am not exaggerating when I say this one here is the best one I have ever built. So this Nintendo DS Lite has been reshelled with one of the kits from Extreme Rate. Now before they brought these out, all of the DS Lite kits were the same. They were like an impersonation of the original ones, but they weren't quite as good. And the plastic wasn't quite as good and they didn't fit together quite as well. And generally, once you'd finished, it might have looked all right, but it felt like a bit of a downgrade. This is a whole new kit. It's not using those same molds and it fits together much, much better. It's got like a nice matte finish and they also do them in a range of different styles. In this case, I've gone with this kind of Pokedex aesthetic, which I really like, but there's all sorts of other ones that you can get online. Now, prior to this, I did do this clear one as well, um, which is actually exactly the same mold but it's a slightly different sort of plastic. It is pretty cool. I quite like it, but I'm definitely preferring this one. So the plastic with the clear seems to be slightly softer and I encountered a few issues when I was doing this build, but I suppose when I was doing this one, I'd already put this one together recently. So you've got to think maybe if I'd built that one first, this might've turned out better. I don't know, but certainly in terms of this kind of matte finish, in terms of the aesthetic with the quality of the print, and the different colors of buttons and things like that. I really like this one. It feels fantastic to play. Although it's quite an involved process doing a swap on a DS Lite shell, it's not impossible. If you take your time, keep your patience, you can do a really good job. And honestly, like I have built so many of these things. It's almost like going through the motions sometimes I've done that many, but every now and then you finish putting something together and you think, oh, I really like that. And that's what this is. Now there are a few key differences between this and the original DS. The most noticeable one is it's not got that raised logo on the top surface. It's like a smooth, flat, clean finish, which I really like. Also the D-pad and buttons, instead of having like the printed graphics on them, they're slightly indented into the buttons. And I think they look really nice. It's a very high quality mold. It doesn't look cheap. It certainly doesn't feel cheap. The start and select are slightly indented as well into the front of the console. The other interesting thing is that the border around the lower screen is now actually part of the lower shell. So you'd need to remove that from your original screen to put it in place. But for the most part, they've kept enough features that it's still absolutely recognizable as a DS Lite, which is one of the best handheld consoles ever created. So in this video, I'll be going through the process of how to get the parts out of your original DS Lite and put them together into one of these shells to get yourself a console that's as awesome as this. So first, let's take a look at the kit. Now with this kit in particular, it came with loads of alternate sets of buttons and things like that. It's not just like, oh, the A and B are this color, the D-pad's this color. You get to kind of pick and choose what you want, which is quite nice. It really does create your own sort of custom console. So there's the shell itself and all the bits and pieces you need for assembling it. There's tools, including a prying tool and two actually half decent small screwdrivers. One's a tri-point and one's a crosshead. There's actually four sets of buttons included in different colors, which means you can pick and choose whatever you want when you're putting it together. There's also various labels and stickers and other bits and pieces you need, as well as two possible replacement lenses to choose from for the top half. Now the shell itself is lovely. It's got a matte finish, which is really different to the glossy feel of the original DS Lite. The colors painted onto the plastic itself. You can see inside that it's white plastic, so time will tell how well it wears but it does look and feel great. And the Pokedex graphics on the top are a really high quality print. And as mentioned earlier, there's an overlay on the lower half of the shell to cover the screen borders. So then it brings us onto a donor console. If you've got a new shell, you still need the original internal parts to put into it. My point here would be if you've got a DS in perfect condition, keep it that way. There's not as many of them about as there used to be. The hinges on these things are delicate. Ideally, you want one that's at least got some sort of damage to it, whether it's the paintwork worn off on a colored one or certain bits have become discolored or if it's been dropped a few times and chipped on the corners or if your hinge is damaged. So something like that, provided it all still works, is going to be your best choice for putting a brand new shell onto your console. Now, in the case of my one, I had an original red one that was in quite a state of disrepair. Part of the hinge was broken, so it just kind of flip-flopped open and closed and in doing so it appeared to have caused some damage to the ribbon for the top screen because the top screen wasn't working anymore either. Thankfully from lots of previous projects I've got various spare bits and pieces lying around in my shed here so I had a few spare top screens to test out which I hoped would work 
with my console. Everything else seemed to be working fine. So to open it up, yes, you've got the crosshead and the tri-point screwdriver provided and the prying tool. I would say if you've got a spudger, that will be really, really handy for various jobs throughout the whole build. And if you've got a sharp knife, that will come in handy when you're removing some of the screw caps later on. So to open it up, turn it over, lay it flat on its front and on the back, you'll use the pointed end of your spudger to remove the two rubber feet, which cover two gold colored screws, which you'll need to remove with your crosshead screwdriver. After that, you can use the same screwdriver to remove the battery cover and then lever out your battery. Inside the battery compartment in the top right is a crosshead screw that you'll need to remove. This is short. The screws on the other three corners are a bit longer. When you're putting it back together, make sure you get them in the right place to avoid any tears. Once those three are out, use your tri-point screwdriver to remove the small black screw that's in the DS slot. You should now be able to remove the back from the front half. Lift it away near the R button and run your spudger around the gap. It should unclip when it gets near the Game Boy Advance slot and you'll be able to lift the back shell off completely. Carefully pop off the L and R buttons, keeping your fingers on the springs to keep that whole little assembly together. And then you're looking for two crosshead screws on the motherboard, which you're gonna remove next. You'll see two wires that are connected to the board with little clips. Use your spudger to lift these off. And then the Wi-Fi cable will need sliding out from underneath the DS slot. This is a bit tricky and it's even worse getting it back in later, but be patient, it does come out. I then removed the faulty ribbon that was connecting the top screen by flicking up the catch and just taking it out from the slot. Now at this point, I could remove the main motherboard, but do be careful because the lower screen is still attached to it. Now at this point, I needed to test my spare top screens. I took the first one, tried plugging it into the slot, put the battery in the right position on the back and powered it on. And thankfully it worked first go. It was perfect match. It wasn't even a slightly different shade, which you can sometimes get with the DS Lite screens. Now, although I had a top screen that was working now, I still needed to open up the original top assembly to get to a few of the other bits and pieces in there and also to show you how to open it up because this is a tutorial video for the most part. So next use a sharp knife to remove the four screw covers in the top screen assembly. Put the tip of the knife carefully into the gap between the plastic and the rubber, tilt it away from the rubber and it should lever it and lift it out. And then you do that with all four, you can get access to the screws. They're all cross heads, remove all of those. And now you'll be able to disassemble that top part by sliding the two parts away from each other that it's a kind of a fit together and slide assembly. So you need to slide the top part up a little bit before you can separate the two halves. Now at this point, take a good look at the arrangement inside, maybe even take a photo that you can use for reference when you're putting it back together. Also at this point, I've got a soft mouse mat that I started working on because I didn't want any scratches getting on the new shell while I was putting it all together. So below where that was, I laid out the new top shell ready to put that whole assembly together in there. The screen part has got the two speakers already attached to it. They're soldered to the ribbon there. But also we're gonna need the microphone and the Wi-Fi antenna, which are also in that top assembly. These are all quite easy to get out and there's no screws involved. So get the Wi-Fi antenna first, lay it in place, route the wire and pinch it in place with the little pins. If you've got a clear shell though, do be careful of this. When I did it on mine, it put a bit too much strain on that pin and it broke a little bit inside and you can see that's the problem with doing a clear shell. You can see everything that goes wrong in there. So be really careful with that. If you're doing a clear shell, maybe route the wire around it instead of pinching it through. But with this one, it fitted perfectly and held it neatly in place. Place. Then you've got the microphone to put in place. Just push it into the hole in the middle. You might need to kind of use your spudger to help nudge it in position properly and then route the wire across in the same way it was in the original assembly. At this point, I put the two wires through the opening to stop the whole thing falling out, but I didn't really need to do that and I wouldn't recommend you necessarily do that. Before putting the speakers in position, make sure you've got the two little rubber membranes. There's two little like circular washers that go in between the shell and the speaker, which will help reduce any vibrations. Put those in place first. Now have a look through the many bags of bits that comes with this kit, you're looking for a small square self-adhesive sponge piece that's dark gray. That goes inside the shell where the solder points for the speakers are resting in the top screen assembly. It goes in the same place as the little sponge square on your original shell, so just take a look at that. So when I built this clear one, I kept the original top lens. It was in really good shape and it made a much easier build for me. However, on this one, after I'd cleaned it up, there were a few nicks and scratches that I wanted to get rid of. And when I'd looked at the pictures of the kind of original Pokedex, I realized that the 
red surround wouldn't actually be as good as the white and thankfully this kit comes with one that's got a white surround so in this case I decided to disassemble that top screen and put the new lens on. So with the kit as well as the lens there comes a self adhesive frame so with the adhesive strip I removed the center peeled off the backing and placed it into the shelf. This is tricky to get right so be patient I think it might have been easier to leave the center in and remove it afterwards. I removed the old lens starting at the corner get a thumbnail in or a spudger or something like that and carefully start peeling off it'll probably bring the adhesive with it. There are a few small specks left over but no raised profiles so I didn't remove that just in case I added any little bits of dust onto the screen. Peeled off the backing from the adhesive and lower the screen in place making sure it's the right way up. Flip it over and check for any dust. I used a little bit of masking tape just to lift off any specks. Check the new lens, work out which is the back and the front. The back has the colour border printed on it. Peel off the protective layer, line it up and drop it in place. It's a good fit. One of the things I always found really disappointing about the overall aesthetic of the previous repro shells that I've used is that when you put these screens on the black adhesive kind of shows through. There's a little bit of translucence to the lens. In this case it's not. Those coloured borders are really opaque so when I stuck it on it was still a nice solid white which was really nice to see. So now flip it back over and with the screen in place you need to get the speakers in position. If you look at the bottom of the screen there's like a little recess where you can route the cables and there's a white sticker on each side that holds those cables in place. Sit the speaker in position and then route the wires along using a spudger to push them in place. If you're using a clear shell again don't use those pegs just bypass it because you don't want to damage that plastic. So I pulled the wires from the antenna and the mic back through at this point because I needed that hole clear for the ribbon to go in place. To get the ribbon through you've got to roll it up with the tab on the inside into a little tube until it's small enough to push through that opening. If you're patient with it it'll go through fine. Just be very careful not to tear the ribbon otherwise you're going to need a whole new screen. Now you need to put the little metal ring onto it. Don't use the original that's actually too small. The one that comes with this kit is slightly longer. You're going to need the slightly longer metal tube. So you just slide that over the ribbon that's all rolled up into a tube, push it into the housing and then you'll be able to pull out the ribbon and unravel it ready to go and attach to your lower board. After this you can feed your other two wires back through again. So now you're ready to attach the top shell but before you do there are four stickers to put in place. There's four little rectangular black stickers and there's markings on the inside of the shell where you can see they go. Also look at your old shell to spot where they go. They just hold the screen in place. They were quite tricky to peel but once peeled it's easy to sort of hold them in position with tweezers and then press down with your finger. There was also a metal grounding strip on the original shell. There doesn't seem to be one that comes with this kit. So I peeled it off the old shell, stuck it in position on the new one and it stayed in place fine. Now you're ready to assemble that top part. Look for the hooks in the ends of the shell. They need to push together when they're next to each other and then it slides across to lock everything in position and try and align the screw holes. Once that's aligned correctly, put the four small crosshead screws in place. At this point, I tried out the driver that came with the kit and it was actually pretty good. I didn't want to use my big screwdriver because I didn't want too much torque and I didn't want the screws to actually strip. So using the smaller screwdriver at this point took a little longer but was a safer bet. I didn't want to cause any damage to the plastic. It was very, very delicate on the clear one that I built. So I was extra cautious with this one. So now that upper assembly is all done, but I didn't want to put the screw covers in until I tested it and made sure it was all working. Turning it over to look at that print as it was together, it, it did look really nice, particularly with the white border on the screen. So that was worth taking the time to do. And as I say, it wasn't actually as difficult as I expected. So the next thing we need to do is prepare the lower screen. So I removed that from the motherboard. There's two ribbons attaching it, a very small one on the other side of the board where you need to lift up the lever and take the ribbon out. That's for your touch screen. And then a larger one, similar to the one we had for the top screen, where you just flip up the catch and slide out the ribbon. So first of all, if your touch screen is in good condition, I recommend that you keep it, but you will need to remove the border from around the outside edge. And if you're not careful, when you lift off that border, you might lift off the top layer of the touch screen which you don't want to do so I find the best way of doing that is get the flat edge of a spudger and just kind of work it from the screen side work it underneath the border at some point near a corner give it a little bit of a wiggle and it'll start to lift up now as soon as you can lift it away from that touch screen use the spudger to keep the pressure down on the screen itself so it doesn't lift away that top layer and just lift that border very slightly as you lift it move the spudger into position underneath it lift it a bit more with the pressure down on the screen the whole time with the spudger work your way all around the edge just moving the spudger along lifting the border slightly moving along lifting it eventually you'll make your way all the way around and it'll come off quite easily with the whole touch screen intact at this point though you will see a lot of dirt build up around where that border used to be plus maybe a tiny bit of adhesive tiny bit of moisture on that screen and a microfiber cloth should clean it up fine
fine. So at this point, I could have carried on and I could have used this one. It was working fine. It wasn't too scratched up. But in this case, I decided if it's a whole tutorial, if someone's actually doing this and their screen is damaged, then I want to show people what to do. So I've got a replacement one that I got from Z Labs a long time ago. I've had it sat here for a long while. They've got much better ones now that have adhesive strips attached that are made out of glass that should be a much clearer image. But the one that I used on this was an older plastic one that didn't have the adhesive. But it did the job and now it's in position. It's a really nice clean finish with no scratches. So first on your original screen, you need to remove that touch layer. Now the touch layer is actually quite thick. If you've got a replacement one, you can look at the thickness of that and be able to tell straight away which part you need to remove from the old one. Starting at the corner, work a thumbnail or a spudger or a prying tool into the gap and then just slightly carefully move it away. Again, a bit like we did with the lens at the top, just keep that gradual gentle pressure on there. Don't try and pull it all off in one go. You'll see the adhesive just gradually separate all the way along and it'll probably stay attached to the original front bit. Then you've got your exposed screen. Try and do this relatively quickly and avoid letting any dust get onto the screen itself in between those two layers because if it gets in there, it's going to be difficult to get out again later. Again, a little loop of low tack masking tape just gently dabbed on where you've got any specks of dust tends to get those out perfectly. So actually sticking the touch layer onto the screen itself it needs to be aligned perfectly but to do this and get it in the right position use the shell to help. So first starting with the touch screen making sure it's the right way up and the right way around lower it into that shell then get your screen with the adhesive attached and lower that in on top of it. Push it into position and then when you pull it back out again that touch layer will be in exactly the the right spot. Just push it all down to make sure the adhesive's right and you are good to go for the next bit. So next up I'm moving on to the rear shell. We've got a few bits that we need to put in place on there before we put the whole thing together. The ground shield first it's got a plastic backing that you'll need to peel off and then you just lay it in place as shown. I borrowed the existing screws. To be honest I could have used the existing plate because the quality of the original one seems to be a bit better and would have fitted but I used all the new parts in this build. So with those two screws removed I put them in on the new shell and then you're trying to find a little self-adhesive squishy metal rectangle you'll know it when you see it and that sticks in position in the same way that it was on the original ground shield from your strip of those black self-adhesive pads there is a square piece that goes just to the left of where the ground shield is on the lower right of your battery compartment then find the rectangular nut which you need to hold the battery door in place the amount of times i've forgotten to put these in and i go to put the whole thing together and go to put the battery door on and it, it won't lock in make sure you get that nut in position because that is what holds the battery lid screw in in place. Slide it in position carefully. You might need to use tweezers for this and then use one of the rectangular stickers to just hold it in place. Then you've got your stylus holder. Remove the three screws from your old one, put the smaller bit in first, it just slots in place and then the longer part hooks in place near the stylus opening and then lowers down and pushes in position. Then you've got three holes to put your screws in and that's all secured in place. At this point try sliding in your stylus, it should go in and lock in place absolutely fine. Next up you've got the covers for your power switch and your volume slider and again it's your choice in terms of the colors we've got four different bags of colored buttons you can do whatever you like I went with blue on the volume slider and white for the power switch and I quite like how that looked in the end each of these just slides in at a slight angle and then tilt into position make sure they both slide as they should I took the light guide for the power LED and put it into the hinge cap again check with your old one to make sure you get it the right way around at this point I decided to put together the little blank Game Boy Advance slot cover use your tripod point driver to undo it it slides across and separates in the same way that the top part of the shell did remove the pcb transfer it to the new shell making sure that the pins are visible line everything up and slide it in place put the screw in but don't slot it into the shell until the motherboard is in place later now it's time to attach the top screen assembly to your faceplate feed the two wires through the hinge end opening and then line up the ribbon with the slot by tilting it and carefully sliding it through it's not actually as difficult to do as you might think get your hinge barrel from your old shell and slide it in position making sure that the slots are all aligned correctly it should just push in place fine now get your hinge cap which has got your light guide in place line it up with the end of the barrel push it on and then lower it in position onto the face plate there's some little lugs to help locate it quite easily hold that in position 
line and then you've got two long crosshead screws to go in there from the back and secure that in position. Once they're in place, carefully try opening and closing your hinge, being very careful of that delicate lower thin strip on the faceplate, but it should open and close quite securely. After that, it's time to get your buttons in place. Again, you can choose whatever colors you want from those four different sets. I went with a black D-pad. Once that was in position, I put one of the silicon membranes that's included with the kit on top of that to hold it in place. Then my A, B, X, Y, I went with white for A and B and blue for X and Y. I really like the quality of these buttons. They've got these little indents for the labels that look really nice and feel quite good to play on too. Once those four are in place, put the silicon membrane on. This is different for the D-pad and the ABXY. Make sure you get those right. There's one with a little square in the middle that goes on the face buttons. Finally, the start and select. I know it's a little bit boring. I looked at lots of different color options, but I went with black on those. In fact, they're not technically black. It's like a very dark gray, but it looks really nice on the final thing. When you've got the silicon membranes in place, you can actually flip it over and take a look to see how it is. So you can keep swapping them over without having to dismantle the whole console. So with those in position and the three silicon membranes in place, it's time to get your motherboard ready for going in. What I did at this point, just to be on the safe side, was cleaned up the contacts for the D-pad and the buttons using a little bit of contact cleaner and the cotton bud. So I think one of the trickiest bits in this process is actually taking the ribbon from the top screen and inserting it into the motherboard. So before you attach anything else on the lower half, do this first. Make sure the catch is lifted up on the locator for the ribbon, slide it into the socket when you've definitely got it lined up in position and believe me it goes in maybe a little bit further than you might think. Once it's secured in position, flip the catch down and that'll lock it in place. Next you can attach the lower screen with the main ribbon. There's also the touchscreen ribbon which hooks over the top and locks in position. I didn't put this in until later and it was really fiddly to do so if I was doing it again and if you're doing it now I would attach the two ribbons for your lower screen at the same time but anyway you'll see how I got on with that. Now the last thing to do before the motherboard is in place is the microphone wire actually roots across the top edge of the faceplate. You'll see there's a little slot where you can just push the wire in and it'll hold in place. Then just lower your motherboard in position being careful to locate the screen first and everything should just, just drop in place. Then you've got that dreaded wire which goes underneath the DS cartridge slot. The wire's a little bit kinked if you kind of carefully smooth it out so it's straight you can just hold it flat against the motherboard and gradually move it across. It'll take a few attempts but eventually it will come out the other side and you can start to root everything then. So it's at this point where I decided to put that tiny little touchscreen ribbon cable in and it was actually really fiddly to do but again just be patient with it. Lift up the little catch, locate the ribbon in position, slide it in, push the catch down, click it, make sure it's in position and then that is done. Next don't forget your Wi-Fi board that was removed from the motherboard. It just slots and holds in position. Then you've got those two wires to reconnect in place where they were before. Just line them up, push them down and you should feel a satisfying click as they go in place. After this if you need to just reroute the wires slightly to tidy them all up. Now the last thing before we put it all together is our L and R triggers. Now remember we've got this face down so it's being flipped over. So your L trigger is actually going on the right and your R trigger is going on the left. So just watch out for that. The assembly for each trigger is made up of three parts. You've got a spring, a pin and the button itself. So when you're putting this assembly together it is important to have the right spring on the right side. So first of all check that your two springs are slightly different. So when you're putting it together the spring locates in the gap on the button and then the pin goes through the center and holds the whole lot in place. When that's being assembled one end of your spring will go inside the button. The other end of the spring is going to twist around and hold in place on a catch. That other end needs to be at the bottom of the spring coil. If you've got it the wrong way up and that bit's at the top when you try and spring it around and locate it in place it'll keep pinging out and it'll drive you mad especially if it happens after you've reassembled the whole thing. So it might feel like I'm laboring this but trust me and anyone who's done this before will know what I mean. Make sure you get the right spring on the right side it'll save you a lot of hassle. Putting that assembly together it can feel like it falls apart easily but if you put the spring in position then push the pin through and then put a little bit of tension on the spring just hold the spring in place that will lock the pin in position and you can lower it onto the face plate where the pin locates in place and use the end of a spudger or some tweezers to just push the end of the spring round and locate it into the little slot on the faceplate. Do the same on the other side and just do a quick check by holding down the pin in place and just check your two buttons to make sure that they engage correctly. So now you are ready to do your final assembly on the shell. So take the rear shell that we put together earlier, make sure that your volume slider is all the way across to the right and that the volume slider cap is also in the same position. Also check your power switch and make sure that that slid all the way down to the off position. Put the rear shell on by kind of hooking it on near the Game Boy Advance slot and then lowering it down towards the triggers. If it doesn't quite locate, try wiggling the triggers slightly and it should just pop in place. Now it did need a little bit of pressure to hold it in position, but it didn't feel like anything was pinching. And once the 
screws were in place, it held together fine, so I didn't have any issues with that. For the screws, I started with those two gold ones at the footholds first, then the three tri-point ones on the left top and bottom, and on the right lower. Do not put any of them in the upper right because it'll burst through your faceplate and ruin your whole console. Then you've got that tiny black tri-point screw into the DS slot, followed by the small crosshead screw that goes in the upper right inside the battery compartment. Then you can put your battery in place, get your battery cover in by slotting the tabs at the top in an angle and then lower it in. It shouldn't need any pressure, it should just drop in place. Then look in the bag that had all the nuts in. There is a screw in there that's half threaded and half plain. That's the specific one that you need to locate in that nut. Don't use any of your other screws. Screw that in place and don't over tighten it, especially if you've got a clear shell because in my case it put a few stress marks on there that I wasn't particularly happy with. Now you're fine to slide that dummy Game Boy Advance cartridge in place and it's time to test your console. So switch it on, keep your fingers crossed and hopefully everything will work. Chances are if something goes wrong it'll be the display not working on one of the screens and chances are the reason that didn't work is you haven't put the ribbon all the way in in which case you'll need to open it up, reseat those ribbons, put it back together and hopefully it'll work. Thankfully in this case everything worked first go. So after a battery has been removed and put back in when you boot up you'll need to put in your data again so you need to put things like the name, the date, time, birthday, all that kind of stuff. When that is done it saves it and shuts the console down. After that it's time to test it out with the game at which point I realized I hadn't actually tested the original console and that that cartridge slot might not work so yeah if you're doing this test that it all works first and test that it runs games i tried it with the pokemon cartridge that i've got and it didn't load i think it's a bootleg cartridge anyway so it's always been a bit of a pain in terms of loading i've got a big brain academy one that i always use as my test cart because it loads on everything put that in tested it and it was registering that it was in there so i cleaned up the cartridge slot using a little bit of that contact cleaner that i mentioned earlier just put it onto my good cartridge put it in and out of the console a few times and then put my pokemon cartridge in again and thankfully it loaded and it looked great and I've done a little bit of test playing on it. The buttons feel really nice. The screens look great. The touch screen's responsive. And just as an overall console, I think it's really nice. As I said earlier, like I have built a lot of DS consoles and I never find it to be a particularly satisfying experience generally because the quality just isn't there. So the quality of the overall console doesn't feel that great. Occasionally there's been the odd good one, the Zelda ones are pretty good, but for the most part they're underwhelming and they don't really fit together that well. This fits together perfectly. There were no bits that felt like I was having to force it. The final end result feels like a really high quality product, feels like a proper official Nintendo product, feels really nice and solid. I'm really pleased with it. If you want to get hold of one of these or look at all the different ones that are available, you can get them on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description. Speaking of links, I've got a discounted link for Z Labs in the description that's where you can get these replacement touchscreens as well as loads of other nintendo ds spares definitely go and check them out and if you end up in a situation like i did earlier but you don't have a spare top screen don't despair you can always have a go at building yourself one of these game boy macro consoles if you want to find out more about what these are check out the video i'm going to leave linked up here otherwise i'll see you in the next one bye